Hey there, Marketing Analytics students. It's Dr. Baker. In this video, we're going to be covering some of the highlights of the CTEC Corporation case study. And more importantly, we'll be covering some issues related to resource allocation optimization. Our learning objectives for this video is to understand the common marketing application of resource allocation optimization. We're going to be using Ingenious for designing, implementing, and reporting resource allocation optimization. We're going to do a little refresher on some common response model types and response model selection criteria. We'll be conducting some what if and scenario testing with our resource allocation model. And finally, we'll check some underlying assumptions of our resource allocation model. Since we're mostly going to be using the CTEC Corporation case as a way to learn about resource allocation optimization, let me give you a brief overview of some highlights of the case. CTEC Corporation is a company that sells grinding wheels, abrasive, and adhesive products. Their primary selling strategy is direct sales and distributor partnerships. They have 33 lines of business, essentially acting as an independent operation. Our hero in this case study is John Sawyers. He's a sales manager of the Grinding Products Division. The Grinding Products Division has 14 US sales branches. Right now, John Sawyers is hampered because corporate won't let him hire an additional sales force member or members, so he's trapped at using only 52 at a max, distributed across these 14 different sales branches. The objectives of this particular project is to see if we can work smarter and equally harder. Can the extant sales force be reallocated to improve profits? There's going to be some needs that we need to collect if we're going to endeavor to try to figure out how to reallocate the sales force. First, we need to calibrate the sales force effort and impact response models for each of the individual 14 sales branches. By effort, we mean the number of salespeople, that's our unit of effort, and our impact is sales. The problem that we have here is there's a lack of helpful historical data about different levels of effort and impact at each one of these sales branches. So rather than using secondary data or historical data to try to calibrate these response models, in this case, they did something where they tried to harness the managerial wisdom to establish all of the required modeling input. So the percent margin, the salesperson costs, the impact level expected for each additional unit of salesperson added at a branch and so on. Uh, to see how this procedure of harnessing sort of the wisdom of the managerial crowd was done, check the appendix one of the case. We don't cover that here in this actual video, uh, but it is an interesting exercise in how to reach group consensus amongst a, diff a series of different managers. With the basic background of the case introduced, let's set up the resource allocation model within Ingenious. There's a few things that we're gonna to need to pay attention to. We're gonna to need to set up a base scenario. We need to consider which different levels of inputs or number of salespeople we're considering at each of the 14 sales branches and correspondingly the impact levels expected and whether or not there's any segment level or global level constraints that we need to set for the model. In Ingenious, we have an entire table dedicated to our base scenario. Notice that we have the 14 different regional markets organized in columns. Notice that we have the current number of sales reps in the first row here. In this case, by current number, we mean the hypothetical current number or the status quo. And the current sales value here is also, again, a hypothetical value, again, harnessed through that managerial wisdom process that was described in Appendix 1. So this basically says, at this level of sales representatives in that particular market, here's the sales that we can expect to have if we sort of engage in this status quo. In addition, there's two other relevant rows. We have a cost per sales rep, so $147,000 of total cost per sales rep that we add. And our margin here is estimated to be 35%, and that doesn't vary um, across any of the markets. Next, we have to input our effort and impact data into Ingenious. This is inputted as two separate tables that must be corresponding in terms of number of rows and labeling for the rows and number of columns and labeling of the columns. Let's focus in here on the high row to understand how to interpret each one of these tables. So notice we have our base amount of effort just above the high row. That base represents that same number of salespeople that we had in the base scenario in the previous slide. We're imagining that we added an additional salesperson, an increment of one, it didn't have to be an equal increment, but it happens to be for this case, to each one of the markets. Now, if we add this hypothetical additional salesperson, again, harnessing the man managerial wisdom of the crowds, as described in Appendix 1, these were the estimated sales that we would accrue in each one of the markets if we add an additional salesperson. And we proceed to do the same in all the other scenarios. I would draw your attention to 
an effort of none where we have no salespeople, notice that we still expect to have some impact. So in other words, we have other ways that we sell our product in these regional markets other than through direct sales. So we would expect to still maintain a certain level of sales even if we had no salespeople. In addition, we also have this row called saturation. And what saturation is identified as is, let's just imagine we hypothetically have an infinity number of salespeople or some arbitrarily large number. There's some point where we expect that we simply cannot sell any more product in a given market, right? We literally run out of people to sell to. So our impact data down here is assuming even if we had an infinity amount of sales effort, this is the absolute highest number of sales we can have. So it's a ceiling effect, in other words. In addition for Ingenious, we can also add segment-specific constraints to our model, setting a minimum number of salespeople that we must have in a given region or a maximum number of salespeople we absolutely must have. So this is the table that we would adjust if we were saying to Ingenious, hey, try to figure out the absolute way to maximize our profitability, but do so while holding true to these particular constraints. At this point, we're not gonna set any segment-specific constraints aside from saying that we can't have anything less than zero salespeople in a market. Now, in the future, we are going to want to mess around with these segment-specific constraints, and these could be important because they allow us to test some practical uh, managerial considerations. There's a few other inputs that we need to attend to in the reallocator model for Ingenious. Notice here, uh, at this time, we aren't adjusting and setting any of the constraints, even though the box here is checked for segment-specific constraints. You'll recall on the previous slide that we really didn't have any constraints set yet. And we are not going to set any global, global minimum or global maximum just yet. Uh, in terms of reporting, this isn't a constraint setting or anything, but we are gonna ask for Ingenious to conduct a sensitivity analysis. This is gonna do a whole bunch of different what-if scenarios varying the total number of salespeople that we might allocate across the 14 different markets. And finally, I should note, uh, any of the results that you see in this video is presuming that I ran uh, Ingenious while generating an Excel-based report. There's one more spot here in setting up our resource allocation model that we really need to pay attention to, and that's the response function. So for each one of these 14 models, Ingenious is going to take the inputs, the different hypothetical levels of salespeople, and their outcomes, the different hypothetical levels of sales, and it's going to fit a mathematical response model uh, uniquely to each one of these 14 uh, markets. Each one of these 14 uh, response models is going to be unique, but we have some flexibility in choosing how the actual mathematical form of the model is built. We can choose between an ad bug model, an exponential model, and a logistic model, or alternatively, we could simply select automatic. If the automatic option is selected, Ingenious will test all three of the models in each one of the segments and select which one of the three fits best. Now this immediately sounds very appealing. You're like, of course I would want, I'd want Ingenious to automatically pick the best fitting of the three models, but there is a potential downside to this. That would imply that across the different segments, entirely different mathematical formulations might be used to build the response model. So an exponential model might be fit to markets two and three, a logistic model might be fitted to uh, markets eight and nine, and so on. And this could be a bit complex, and in my opinion, a bit needlessly complex in many situations, rather than just relying on a single mathematical formulation. For this particular case study, I always fit a logistic response function to all 14 of the geographic markets. At this point, we actually have everything set up in Ingenious and we're actually ready to run the model. However, let's do a quick refresher on the three different response model forms that we, that we could select from. I'd like to illustrate for you what the ad bug model, logistic model, and exponential model uh, is. And we'll do so by focusing on one specific geographic market in this example. Uh, that'll be Los Angeles. I made this table myself, just so we're clear, this isn't something that came from Ingenious, but these effort and impact values do come directly from the tables that you saw previously, right? So these are the different levels of salespeople in terms of effort, that's the input to our model. And here's the estimated sales uh, dollars, so in, in, in hundreds of thousands, so here's our impact. So we're gonna use this input and output to calibrate uh, three different models. 
So I actually ran this simulation three different times, grab the numbers, and I will be placing them into uh, the results here so that you can see you can see them yourself. First, let's take a look at what the add bug function is. So the add bug function is usually presented in this particular form where Y, of course, is the outcome. X represents our input. And then there's four different parameters that have to be estimated, A, B, C, and D. And typically, uh, the add bug function takes on a S-shaped curve. Uh, I wanted to represent the add bug function using the parameter labels that Ingenius uses so that it's easier for us to map the parameters onto the function. So we'll see something called the floor, ceiling, slope, and intercept, and we'll use those to rebuild that. And then ceiling and floors and means exactly that. So ceiling is the absolute highest number of sales we could have no matter how hard we try with salespeople. And the floor is the absolute minimum number of sales we'll have no matter how few salespeople we have. So after actually running an ad bug fitted model in the reallocator model, uh, the output includes a spot here where you see the parameters for each one of the 14 markets. In this case, again, focusing just on Los Angeles. And here are the parameters that were estimated for the ceiling, floor, slope, and intercept. So I take those numbers and I plot uh, and I map them back onto the equation. And then if I take the different, different effort levels, I'm able to actually recreate in Excel or any other software tool, I could recreate this curve. This blue curve here represents, of course, the add bug fitted function. These red dots represent the actual original input data. Notice that the curve doesn't fit perfectly to the data, but it's a close fit. The other option that we can select from is the logistic function. We're pretty familiar with the logistic function. We've used it in several other cases and other examples. Also, it has four different parameters that have to be estimated, A, B, C, and D. And the way it's going to be presented to us here in the reallocator model is the A parameter is actually the ceiling minus floor, the D is the floor, the B here is the intercept and the C is the slope. So typical way it's often introduced or similarly, and this is the way the parameters are labeled in Ingenious. And now I have my same, same for Los Angeles, same effort and impact data here, but now we have new parameters here and I plug those into the logistic function here, which creates this blue line, this curve here. And again, notice that the curve doesn't perfectly fit the data, but it's close. Finally, the last type of model that we can choose is the modified exponential function. Modified exponential function has three parameters that need to be estimated, A, B, and C. And the way it'll be presented to us in Ingenious is the A is represented as ceiling minus floor, C is represented by floor, and B is something called the exponent. And there's something a little strange about the floor parameter reported in Ingenious I would like to highlight that for you next. So here's our plot that we'll make for the exponential. Notice the shape of the curve is a little different than we saw previously. Again, this is the same input and output data, of course, and the fitted results are different because we are now fitting an exponential model, which takes on a slightly different shape. And again, the shape of the model fits close to the data, but not perfectly so, there's some error. And there's one thing I do want to point out that I, I was a, it was a bit curious for me, and I haven't actually gotten an answer from Ingenious yet exactly what's going on. Originally, uh, in the output parameter here for floor, there was a value of 1,412.17 here. And when I used that value and plugged it into the model, I was not able to replicate the same, res uh, the same curve that was shown in Ingenious. But I did notice that when I took the fit here, this floor number here where we tried, where we had zero effort. If I took that number and I plug it up here instead, I was able to perfectly replicate the curve. Uh, frankly, I am not sure exactly what's going on there, if that's just an error or if maybe they use a slightly different uh, expression of the model uh, than I'm used to seeing. But either way, by moving that number up to here, I was able to perfectly replicate it. So we do have a fitted exponential model nonetheless. Finally, I took these three different potential response models, all again for Los Angeles in these four data points, and I plotted them all on top of one another in Excel. By looking at all three of the hypothetical choices we could make for the response model at once, 
I think it's a bit easier to see which one is the best choice for Los Angeles. And again, without doing anything fancy, we could do a simple just eyeball check. We can clearly see here that the thick dotted line, the orange ad bug line, has the closest fit. This would indicate for Los Angeles, at least, uh, that the best choice that we could make is to fit an ad bug line because it, it most closely fits the uh, hypothesized values from management about what sales would be at different levels of sales effort. Although we should probably note that the logistic curve fits quite closely as well. On this messy spaghetti chart, I wanted to show you all 14 of the fitted response models for the 14 markets uh, under the condition that I used for the case example where all 14 of the markets were uh, selected to use a logistic model to fit the data. So of course they all take on this S shape which is what we see when we build logistic models. Um, and of course it's a bit of a mess here but one of the things that we can appreciate even while looking at the spaghetti is that the curvature, the shape, of the response of sales effort to sales impact is not the same for all 14 markets. And if we draw our attention closely here to the high point market, uh, I think that's North Carolina and Los Angeles, we can see there's both a notable difference in their baseline, meaning if you don't do anything, you're still going to sell more, uh, do anything in terms of salespeople, you'll still sell more in Los Angeles. And in addition, You'll notice here that Los Angeles does not hit its saturation point in terms of sales effort uh, until somewhere beyond having 10 salespeople. On the other hand, High Point reaches its saturation point right around about seven salespeople or so. And we really aren't going to squeak out any more sales in High Point, uh, regardless if, if we hire eight, nine, 10 or more salespeople. In Los Angeles, though, it is potential that we could sell more. Now, whether that's profitable is a question of uh, whether we can cover the cost of the salespeople, of course. But it does demonstrate the important differences across these uh, different markets. So at this point, we have covered the introduction of the case. We have established how to set up the allocation model in Ingenious. And we talked about the three different response model types that we might choose and actually compared those specifically in the case of Los Angeles so we get a little better sense of how they might work and the trade-offs and choices we might make when we, when we choose from them. Um, at this point, we'll stop this video. And when we come back in for the next one, we will actually look at the results of our RAN uh, resource allocation model.